Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at some vector calculus. Uh, specifically, we want to look at mean vectors and covariance matrices. All right, so if y is a random vector, so here, <coughs> excuse me, I had some almonds this moment ago. Um, if y is an, a random vector, then the expected value of the vector is the vector of the expected values. All right, I mean, I, that sounds exciting. That sounds shocking, right? So the expected value of the vector is, well, the expected value of the vectors, which is the vector of the expected values. And we'll go ahead and write expected values using mu. All right, so, and what we're saying here is that the expected value of one entry of the vector, it has a, uh, a PDF, and then we calculate the expected value in the normal way. Now, when you see the capital omega, that means over the entire domain. So just remember that. That way, if uh, I'm dealing with something that's you know, maybe like zero to one or uh, negative one to one or negative infinity to infinity, I'm not gonna be you know, trying to specify. Uh, if you ever see a capital omega, that's just the entire domain. That's more of a measure theory way to do it. All right, now, as we work through this, every time we do something, if I don't explicitly say it, the, the assumptions that are needed for the calculation to work out are implied. So for example, for us to have an expected value of a vector, we have to have an expected value of each of the entries. All right, so if the expected value of Y1 does not exist, because like Cauchy distribution or something like that, then I'm not gonna be taking an expected value in this. So uh, for us, uh, yeah, for us, every, everything that I can think of is going to have uh, the variance we define and the expected value will be defined. Uh, so it's just not going to be an issue. We're not going to really get into any pathogenic cases or this type of stuff. Uh, everything's just going to be the way we want it to so that it works out like we want. Now, that's how we got uh, the expected value. Expected value is just the expected value of a vector is a vector. But the covariance of a vector, well, that's actually gonna be a matrix. Why is that? Well, because on the diagonal, we're gonna have the variance of each of the individual entries, but then the off diagonals are going to be the covariances between the corresponding entries of the matrix. Okay, so if Y is a random vector, then we're gonna go ahead, go ahead and say that sigma, capital sigma, is the covariance of Y. And so here, it, in matrix notation, uh, sigma, little sigma sub ij is going to be the covariance of entry i, entry j when i and j don't equal each other, and the variance if i and j are equal. Now, if you write out the formula for uh, a covariance and you, know, and you look at the indices, uh, this is going to be very natural for us to be using it this way. All right, so something about this. The covariance of x and y is the same as the covariance of y and x, correct? So because of that, the covariance matrices are automatically symmetric. Now, covariance matrices are positive semi-definite and positive, and so they're always positive semi-definite no matter what is going on, and they're uh, positive definite if the variables are linearly independent. That's good to know. Now, Something that is very important, if you read uh, the uh, help documentation in R, you'll come upon this when you start looking at, uh, if you look at the uh, covariance matrix function. The covariance of matrices are estimated from data with missing values may or may not be positive definite. And it may not even be positive definite, by the way. So this is something you have to watch out for. So if you use, uh, uh, use pairwise complete observations in the core function of R, then let's say I've got missing data or missing values in my data and to compute the uh, covariance between uh, two different vectors, I just go ahead and take the pairs. Well, it'll work out that if I'm missing at random, it's possible for me to uh, miss, to have a non uh, semi-definite matrix come out as my covariance matrix believe it or not. So, and that's just something to watch out for. It, honestly, most of the time, it doesn't make a difference for us in data analytics, but we should be aware of it in case it comes up as an issue 
like I, if we know that we're going to be doing some heavy lifting computations. All right, so now there's a formula for us. If I have, if I'm taking the covariance, you know, it's very natural that I'm going to be taking the expected value of two things multiplied together. This should look a lot like the regular covariance formula, but you'll notice something's different that I'm taking vectors in here and they're actually the same vectors, believe it or not. And over here, it's a transpose. So remember, if I'm doing regular old covariance, I've got two just completely different variables. Here, since I'm dealing with a vector, I've actually got the same vector by itself. All right, so it works out. If I expand this out and you know, if I distribute the transpose, and then I distribute the, the matrix multiplication, and then I use the linear property of expected values, and I take the expected values of the y times mu, and then you know subtract something off, I'll get this formula right here. I just articulated one of the problems for you, by the way. And here is a faster formula for us to get this. So here I'm gonna get a, if I've got a length p vector, because I've got p variables, this is gonna be a p by p matrix, minus a P by P matrix. All right, so now the expected value of matrices is just gonna be basically the matrix of expected values. I know that this is shocking. Now, if you're someone who has a stronger mathematics background, like you took advanced calculus, or you paid attention during Riemann sums in Calc 1, you can go through and der do the derivation of all of this stuff like directly by hand. It's pretty easy uh, if you take a look at the you know, formula for Riemann sums. And the same is true for derivatives. But things get a little bit squirrely when I try to take you know, the variance of a matrix. It's harder to, to give like clean formulas, so we're just gonna leave that alone for here. So with vectors, our expected value is a vector. Our variance is gonna be represented by a matrix, and when I, now, if my, my random variable is a matrix, we're only going to look at expected values in this class. All right, well, I've got this entire matrix of covariances and variances, right? That's my sigma. Sigma is a whole bunch of different covariances and variances. And is that easy to interpret? If I had 100 by 100 covariance matrix, can I interpret that as a human being? That'd be rather difficult for me. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take the determinant of that and the determinant we're going to interpret as a generalized variance. Now, some statisticians have noticed that if the determinant is small, then Y tends to be close to its expected value. And if the determinant is large, Y tends to be farther away from its expected value. And you notice that this, I'm just saying tens, I'm using vague words because I'm not making this mathematically precise. One of the reasons for that is because this is actually a multi-dimensional aspect. Because if, so let's say I've got uh, 100 variables and one of them is linearly dependent on the other 99. Well, the determinant is automatically going to be equal to you know, so the, then, you know, I'm, it, it's, I'm actually going to have a lower dimensional space contained in a higher dimensional space. And so the determinant is really going to be go, going off of the projection aspect. And so it's like a two-dimensional space and a three-dimensional space. There are two-dimensional subspace and a three-dimensional space. And in that situation, even though like the two-dimensional look can be like really spread out, from a three-dimensional point of view, it can be rather close. So here we're only saying tens, tens to, just to kind of make things a little bit simpler and easier on us. All right, so if I see a small sigma determinant, that, could, that may, may indicate that my variables are intercorrelated. If I see that the, uh, the covariance matrix has small eigenvalues, uh, then I'm gonna look for an equal number of Ys that are nearly dependent to those other Ys. All right, so if I see that I've got three really small 
eigenvalues that are really close to zero, then I'm going to be expecting that three of those y's are, a, are close to being linearly dependent on the other variables. And, you know, that, and that really just follows out from the product of eigenvalues formula of determinants. All right, well, one thing we want to do, we want to have a standardized distance. So why are we standardizing? Well, the same reason why we normalize our variables. You know, we subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. That, if I standardize things, it's easier for me as a human to understand what's going on. All right, so here, if I go through the standardization process, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the I'm going to take y minus its expected value, and then I'm going to take the transpose, multiply by the, the inverse of the covariance matrix, and then I multiply by the vector. So here, the standardized y's will have mean zero, variance one, and they'll be uncorrelated. So this is like normalizing our data, but here it's a multi-dimensional sense. All right, so, and this is also can be interpreted as a distance. I'm not gonna try and say this person's name. Now this, something that's important about this is that this is unitless and uh, it takes into account the correlation of the variables. So remember, if I go through, if I take a variable and I normalize it, I've got, in the numerator, I've got x minus mu that has a unit, whatever that unit, could be feet, could be inches, could be uh, Fahrenheit, could be Celsius, could be meters, uh, barometers, I don't know. And then when I divide by the standard deviation, down here, that standard deviation is in the same units. So remember, when we normalize data, it becomes unitless. Well, this also becomes unitless when I do this. And so when I interpret this, this, everything is on, you know, every time I look at standardized distance, I interpret it on the same scale. It makes it easier for me, but precise information is lost. Now, where this will come up is if I have a really, really tight, like really solid, say my R squared is nine, is like 0.99. I have a really good, tight, linear model. It's not a perfect line, but it's close. If I take the residuals and standardize, then it can look like I've got a lot more spread than I really do. And the same issues will come up here, that if everything is really, if I have very small variance going on and I standardize the distance, things can look more spread out than they really are. All right, now, a correlation matrix. The correlation matrix is very similar to the covariance matrix. So if I'm dealing in theory, I want to work with covariance. If I'm working it with real data, usually we want to work with correlation. Why is that? Well, covariance, because there's like none of this division or inverse business going on, uh, you know, no division, garbage. Because of that, covariance is easier to work with when it comes to proofs and derivations. But when I want to interpret things, it's on a scale I'm not comfortable with. Correlation goes through and it sets it up so that I know by uh, the cauchy schwarz inequality, it's between negative one and one every single time. So it's easier for me to interpret because I know what the ranges of possible uh, values are. So the correlation matrix is just the covariance divided by the standard deviation of each of the variables involved. I know you're shocked, it's, it's amazing. And here, it, the uh, correlation is gonna be one if the two variables are the same, which makes sense. A variable is always perfectly correlated with itself. All right, well, what we can do with this, if I go ahead and I say that D sub, sigma is equal to the diagonals of my covariance matrix and I take the square root. So here we are able to, because, because sigma is positive definite, that means it automatically has a square root. And so it makes sense for me to be taking square roots and the square root of a uh, diagonal with non-negative entries makes sense anyway. And so then it's gonna work out that my correlation matrix is equal to the inverse of this diagonal around the covariance matrix, and the covariance matrix is equal to the diagonal on each side of the correlation matrix. Why do we care about this? Well, this means that if I've got one, I can usually, or if I've got 
the covariance matrix, I can compute the correlation very quickly. And this is a good formula if I have a large amount of data to work with. Because I don't want to go through and compute correlations individually. All right, well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.